sometimes a painting is problem solving. And I've had friends that say, oh no, it's never that. But it is that. Every art form is that at some point. What, what, was, what were you saying earlier? Uh, Dickens. Remember you spoke about Dickens for a second? The quote from Dickens. Dickinson. Dickinson. Emily, the poet, 19th century American poet. Yeah, she just said when um, somebody must have asked her, when do you, when is poetry poetry? And well, it knocks the, when the top of my head explodes, I know. What she's saying is that something so deep, so penetrating my soul, my being, that I know I'm in the presence of truth. And I find that that happens in story. Um, I don't know where this came from, but when I was in seminary, I did everything they told me to do. I did all the philosophy, the theology. I majored in New Testament studies and learned Greek and Hebrew and did all the academic things. But when I left seminary to take a church, I was terrified. I felt like an adolescent. I was 30 years old, chronologically old enough to take a job, but I stood in front of this congregation of people, not very many of them, professional people. I tried to get a job in a steel town, but they wouldn't have me. So I come to this middle-class suburban church and stood up there, scared to death, but never show it. On the inside, I'm scared. On the outside, I look calm and assured. But you know, the funny thing is, I just started talking. Not fancy, but just simple storytelling. Taking biblical stories and putting them in everyday language, as far as I could do that. And as illustrations, things out of my own lifetime, my childhood especially. I told the story simply, plainly, everyday language, dramatic at times, I suppose. People listened. They looked at me, and they looked hungry. And they looked fed, and I thought, my God, I don't feel like I'm doing anything, but they are giving me credit for doing it. They made me feel better about myself by their attentiveness, by their nourished look. And I thought, geez, what am I in the midst of here? I didn't even understand it. So it went on and on, and the more they affirmed me, the better I got, and the better I got, the more they affirmed me, and it kept going higher. It got to be heady stuff. And there are times in the room when Boy, I just thought it was an amazing thing. But then you come down to earth. You think, I have to admit, you think you've got a gift maybe that you can do something the average guy can't do. But I was brought down to earth this way. There was a Sunday morning and the place was full. And the singing at the end was going on. And as I looked over to the right, there was a young lady and she was had her head up in the air and she, she was laughing and she was crying at the same time. I could, I could see the tears from that far away running down her face. And I looked at her and the woman next to her was laughing and I thought, somebody told somebody a good joke. So after the service, I went to her, but before I could get to her, she was brought to me by friends and they introduced her and said, this is so-and-so. And I said, well, it's good to meet you. And she said, uh, good to meet you. And I said, um, I couldn't help but notice you were laughing and crying at the same time during the last hymn. What was going on? Did somebody tell you a good, great joke? And she said, oh no. She said, I've been misplaced for some time. I teach music from school to school. I just came to this town not long ago and I felt lost. And today I felt love in that room. And I said, well, what I was trying to say today, she said, I had nothing to do with what you were saying. And I thought, oh. Oh, jeez. It was the room. It was the people. It was something unidentifiable. Some would call it the spirit. Some would say the spirit of God. The sermon wasn't the point. So you get brought down to earth. Yeah, you do an okay job, but every once in a while it's out of your hands. But there's something in that room, the spirit of the presence. Some people say that the thing, the total is more than the sum of the parts. And there were Sundays when that was the case. So there's some spiritual dimension that we can't control but gets into us. And I think sometimes that's what happens in what I say. Do, do you think uh, that has anything to do with the, your enthusiasm and also your intent, your intention behind 
it sets that in motion and your enthusiasm for creating the love. I think, yeah, I think it all goes together. In fact, it goes back and forth. There was times when I didn't feel like doing it. And I did it anyway. It was a rote. It was a responsibility. I did my duty. But in the process of doing my duty, something snuck in. It was not my doing. But I did have this experience, and I must tell you, um, one of the greatest gifts I've ever gotten from anybody, and this is a powerful spiritual gift, um, I had a tough childhood. I don't want to lament and, and, and whine, but my father drank too much, my mother was ill, and she died at 34 when I was 14 years old. And My father was never clear of mind, he was always uh, um, in some condition of inebriation, and uh, it was hard to relate to him. And I liked staying away from home, and my refuge was movies. Every Saturday I'd walk to the movies, and I'd be coming home at night hoping things would be all right. I had this experience walking down my big long street in Dundalk, Maryland. There were sycamore trees every 25 feet, something like that. And I made this deal as I'm walking. If I can pass two sycamore trees before three black cars come this way, it'll be okay at home. I've said this in so many speeches that I've given to people over the years, and when I do that, they shake their head. And when they shake their head, I say to them, now listen, you're shaking your head. Have you had that experience? And the woman says, yes, yes. And I said, who taught you how to do that? She said, I thought I invented it. So did I. I thought I invented that whole idea. It's almost Jungian, something in the archetypal nature of human beings to make bargains so that good events will occur and not bad events. So I'm in a group of ministers about 30 years ago, nine of us. We met every Friday for two hours. We shared book reviews, pastoral problems, tough translations, this, that, and the other thing. And one guy that was leading the group, a prominent minister in this town, a wise man, a wonderful man, brethren, he said, why don't we tell our stories to each other? Tell your life story. Let's share them. Nine stories. And when he shared his, suburban Chicago, Elm Line streets, only child, father, a professional person, a physician, he went on, and I sat there shrinking in the chair, told my story, then I said to him, do it. I would give half of my left leg to have your childhood. God, you had a wonderful life. I've wanted that all my life. I've wanted Leave It to Beaver and the, and the rest of that stuff, and I never had it. I want your childhood. And this wise man, he never spoke quickly. He looked down, he steepled his hands under his chin, smiled. I thought he was never going to start talking. And he looked at me and he said, you know that among us, we all know that you have some kind of a gift. I'm not even sure you know you have it. To use words in such a way as to make people feel to evoke deep, maybe sometimes lost feelings that they've had and didn't know they had. You make us feel that way. Now listen. And he paused, these long, troubling pauses. He said, what if you'd have had my childhood? You might not have had the gift you have. Did it ever occur to you that what happened to you as a child has made you who you are? Tears came instantly to my eyes. I'd been fighting for all those years to have a better childhood. I didn't have it. But he said, maybe that was the gift. Then I remember that Dostoevsky said, there is no creativity without pain. It started coming together for me. And I found myself saying, if you like who you are today, then it doesn't matter what kind of childhood you had. And I remember this guy, Gordon Livingston, in Columbia. He wrote this book called uh, 30 Things You Need to Know Now. Too soon, old, too late, smart. He said, there should be a moratorium on childhood trauma. And I think that's true. But you can't teach that with academic things. It comes through tears, and it comes through a wise friend telling you something and giving you a precious gift. That's how I feel about that one. 
It's not, it's, it's not something I control. I, I, I just begin to tell the stories and they start, the words start to come and they aren't prepared and it, somehow it works. Have you uh, learned how to take that same gift and give thanks for the problems in your life because of that? Like, has that worked or do you have any version of that? Essentially, that's what I've already had because the problems with my father. But once this man told me this story, I went to my father with whom I had very great difficulty because it, in drinking, by the way, even though I was a Presbyterian minister, his drinking was not a moral thing. It wasn't that at all. The problem was he wasn't himself. He was a clown. My children laughed at his silly jokes until they heard him 42 times. They stopped laughing. They said, do we have to go down there? He would call me on the phone drunk and lecture to me. And are you still there? Are you bored? Well, no, I wasn't bored. I was tired of the whole thing. But when this man told me what he did, I decided, and my father made a decision too, he had lung cancer surgery and decided to stop drinking, just like that cold turkey, and did. And I thought to myself, what kind of man's he gonna be now? I've just been told something about my child. I went down to see him, spent time with him, took initiative to be with him for the first time. We reconciled ourselves. He told me stories about his life. I shared thoughts and ideas and all sorts of things. And it was a renewal of my life. And then I looked forward to seeing him. If I had to go somewhere on a trip for painting, I'd take him with me. We ate and drank and talked. He didn't drink, but I did. And we talked and shared and explored ideas we never had in our entire life. We had 12 years of that before he died, and it was a wonderful thing. The stories that grow out of the childhood have become, I'd use them in sermons, I use them in lectures at the school, and I've got, some people have been asked me to write them and uh, I don't feel like I can write that well, so I've never thought about writing any books or anything of the sort. But I keep getting these requests, those stories you tell. How can we get our hands on those? So what I said was, well, I'll, maybe I'll record them on tape. And I've begun, and I have, I counted a hundred stories that I can tell that make some sense. And um, I don't put any application at the end of them, as I would in class in the lectures, um, one would go like this. When I was very young, I went uh, every Saturday to the movies with my retarded uncle. He was my father's age, but he actually was more like my age. I don't know if I took him or he took me, but we'd go to the old Lyceum Theater, sit in the dark, smelling the leather and the popcorn oil. And downstairs there was a bowling alley and the pins would fall all through the movies. And we looked at movies together, always hoping it wouldn't be a dance or lovey-dovey thing, but Frankenstein would be terrific, a Western would be good. And we looked at the movies, and then as a result of being in the movies, we went home. Here are the kinds of things that happened. One day I was in the movies, and they had in those days, in the 40s, they had a, sometime a double feature. They had um, cartoons, they had comedies, Edgar Kennedy, The Three Stooges, they had previews, and they had all travel logs, Pete Smith specialties, and then the feature. But they also had movie tone news, and I was sitting in the Lyceum Theater, about eight years old, watching girls kicking in a can-can row, and guys running back, touchdowns on the football field, and Lowell Thomas's voice rising in the background over the whole thing. And then somewhere in that movie tone news, they showed the opening up of the concentration camps after the Second World War. Nobody alerted me. Nobody said, look, you're going to see something that's going to knock you out of your socks. Dead people, like cordwood, a bulldozer next to a hole, two American servicemen so thin you could see every bone in their body. And the man was scratching his face, and he brought his hand up so slowly with no emotion whatever, and scratch this face of a man who was dead but alive, alive but dead. I was stunned. I walked home that night, and I couldn't sleep. I had nightmares for weeks. Similarly, we were coming home from the same theater on 4th and D Street, and there was the streetcar there, and sometimes the trolley went off the line, and they'd have to go out and fix it, and in this case, a crowd was gathered around, 
And I went over to see what it was with my uncle. We called him brother. He was Southern, my family was. I tried to go through the crowd, and as I was going through the crowd to see what was going on, a man in a black uniform with silver buttons and a black hat and a silver badge, a fireman, my uncle, Tom, said, no, brother, take him home. Brother took me home. I later learned that the streetcar had run over a young boy and cut his legs off. More nightmares. That's the kind of thing that I had. My grandmother's front porch always sat there on the swing with brother every day when summer was around and we watched him cut down a sycamore tree. We watched the people that came to the house, but there was one guy that came to the house once a week he was the Huckster. I thought that was his name, Mr. Huckster. He had a truck, drove up in front of 312 F Street with swinging scales on the back and a big gray box and bananas and apples and oranges and fruits and vegetables everywhere. And he had a hat he pulled down close, big bushy eyebrows, hair all over the place. He'd walk up, knock on my grandmother's door, and I'm sitting on the, on the um, swing looking at him as he went. My mouth never, never shut. I'm looking at him. And he's talking to her in a sing-song fashion to the screen. And Mrs. Sellers, you would like what today? And he brought a little pad out, got a pencil from behind his right ear and licked the pencil and began to write her order on the little pink slip one day, green the next, brown, white, he would write. And he would say, yes, yes, yeah. I looked up at him. Great big nose with a wart and he had hair coming out of his nose, hair coming out of his ears, a couple of teeth left. And every time when he left, he would turn and look at me, and I'm already wetting my pants, just looking at him. He would turn and look at me, and he said, boy, I didn't know what to say. He looked at me and said, boy, have you been good? Why do adults ask that stupid question, I thought? Have you been good? Uh, I couldn't answer him, but he wasn't done. He said, because boy, if you aren't done, I'm gonna put you in the bag. A real nice joke. It scared the hell out of me. And I'm saying, what's the bag like? I went to bed that night with more nightmares in order. Is it a leather bag like the mailman's bag? It might be, can't be plastic. They haven't invented that yet. Maybe it's a burlap bag. That would scratch the heck out of me. But the fear, have you been good? No. Raises the whole idea of what fundamentalist Christians say. If you aren't good, you're going to go in the bag. And of course, for them, the bag is eternal punishment. Hmm. Those things rattle around in my head, those stories. And there are Sundays in church when the scripture passage yearns for that story to be told. And I find that when I'm telling it, and I didn't even do it halfway well here, I'm not even prepared. I tell the story, and I could almost just stop and go, Bleh! and they'd all fall out of their pews. Now, where's, and these stories go over and over and over. Some have to do with guilt, some with joy, some with universal characteristics that are true of you and me and every single human being on the face of the earth. That's why I guess they work. With the fear? Isn't our media just doing that? Which one? Isn't our, our media? Just uh, the entire media system. It's kind of fearing us into, into uh, some interesting actions. It, it, it always has. I and tell you, I control. Yeah, I don't like these morning shows anymore. Good Morning America, the Today Show. They have too much time to fill, and they keep wanting to say there's something more to, to worry about. They said something about the fact that a playground toy or implement spontaneously burst into flame. Now, here's what you can do about it. Well, how many times is that going to happen on the face of the earth? Once every millennium? Oh, this is something you're worried about, the drugs. Have you asked your doctor whether Cialis is good for you? Have you well, why would you ask your doctor about a drug you don't even understand? Yes, it's, they're making us afraid. I don't understand it, really. I don't. Well, I, um, fear keeps us in, in, in weird control. So now how do we overcome that fear? And, not, and turn it off and see through new eyes. How do we do that? I think we have to have perspective. I think the most, the most important thing in our, in our life is perspective. By that I mean what is important and what is not. 
And if you know what's important and you major in that and you focus your life on that and center your being on what is urgently important, everything else falls away. It doesn't go away, but it's like concentric circles of a, of a stone in a pond. The center splash is the heart of my life and, and my whole being. Then this one's fairly important too, so is this. But on the 30-second ring, who's the guy, don't sweat the small stuff? And then he puts as a subtitle, it's all small stuff. I think perspective is, is, is the most important thing of all. And I think there's wisdom in that because then you immediately, when you're confronted with a situation, make a judgment, how concerned should I be about this? Somebody said one time that if you're in the grocery line and you're beginning to get very annoyed that somebody's looking for every piece of change out of a small purse and holding you up, and then as soon as that's done, there's a price check, and as soon as that's done, the paper ran out of the machine, and you're standing back there tapping your foot holding three eggplants, and um, you're worried, you're, you're starting to feel yourself shake over this anger, and you want to say something. Um, somebody said this, if the irritation and the time it takes is a two on a scale of zero to 10, and you give it an eight reaction, you're hurting yourself. The question to ask is, three hours from now, what will it matter that you stood in line two minutes or 15 minutes? That's perspective, I think. And that's the only way I can have peace, is to realize right away when something occurs, whether it's important or not. You know, spilt milk is the old cliche, but it's true. Clean it up, shut up, move on to the next thing. So what is essential? What is essential, I think, is a good sense of self-worth. Not, I'm a great person and all that thin crap I'm talking about. I know who I am. Uh, I'm not the best guy in town. I'm not the worst either. Here I am. I mean, I've got certain gifts that I can exercise. I don't have others. There's things that I used to think I'd like to be. Now I don't think that anymore. I like who I am. When I'm in that condition, I'm not in competition with anybody. I see people that can do wonderful things, and I say, oh, isn't that great? Jeez, I love what they can do. I don't want to do it. I don't need to do it. But I'm glad they can do it. And people treat me that way. There's also occasions when I, I said about the girl in church that she put me in my place. And it wasn't a harsh thing at all, but she was, she was right. It was just to put things in perspective. You're not the heart of the matter. You're part of it, but you're not the heart of it. One morning I was walking down my driveway to get the newspaper. I've read the Baltimore Sun since I was 12 years old. And I'm walking down a driveway. It's just beginning to, sun's just beginning to rise. And as I'm walking, I realized I haven't got any pain. I have, don't feel bad in the back of my neck. My legs aren't sore. I don't have a headache. I feel good physically. And then I think to myself, I also feel good emotionally. I really feel happy. I feel lifted up. I feel like this day with the sun rising and it's coming into being again is almost like a birth of mine. I'm rising with the sun. I had a spiritual feeling that everything was wonderful. And the word I had to use is equilibrium. I guess it's oriental. Everything was in balance. And as I'm walking down 15 feet from the place where the newspaper is, I hear thump, 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 look up in the air, the uh, helicopter's coming over to the trauma center. And I realize somebody 100 feet over my head might be dying or already dead. And I felt bad about my feeling good. Then I said, no, I can't control that. I really can't. But it did take a shot at my well-being to think that somebody above me might at this very moment be losing their life. But again, that's perspective. I think. Don't we just have to be in the now? Just in the present? Well, I'd like, I, I, that's another and thing. enjoy it. Oh, yes, yes. You've got to live in the now. That's, that's a teaching of anybody who's been wise over the years. It's a Jesus teaching. Take no thought for tomorrow. Don't drag tomorrow's trouble into today. And every great teacher has always said that. Yes, live in the now. Because what we have in the past is done. We can't affect it. What's in the future is yet to come. We can't do that till it gets here. I've pretty much learned that. But every once in a while, there's some 
what's the word? About the past, it would be guilt. What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? About the future, it's anxiety. So to lay guilt and anxiety to rest is to live a much more healthy, emotionally um, nourishing life. Now I believe uh, that the arts have a lot to do with this and it's my field, that's what I do full time. But more than that, when I taught at the community college, I just loved this course. I went through a depression for a couple of years. And if you're depressed, this is before I had some of these revelations and some of this equilibrium of which I speak. When you're depressed, anybody that's been here knows nothing much matters. What you want to do more than anything is sleep because there's no challenge in that state of mind. The only thing, there were two things that gave me any joy I ever had during that period. One was my little granddaughter, just born. I love being with her. I don't even know why. The other thing was teaching this class. For some reason, I could lay aside my own sense of uncertainty and bring everything I had into that class. But when I got done, I realized I was pretending to some degree because I was exhausted. I would just go home and collapse. But that's how important that class was to me. And I know a lot of students didn't even like it especially if they were 17 or 18. You had to be 30 years old to do it. I had friends with me one night in the class, and we went to dinner afterward, and I said, you know, those kids were a little restless tonight. And one man said, wisely, he said, I can tell you why, if you haven't already figured it out. You're asking questions and trying to answer questions they haven't asked yet. If you're 30, you're starting to ask them. And just before I left, I said that to the students. I said, I'm sorry if this has been a drag for you. If you're 17 or 18 years old, I know you don't care about this stuff. And there was a young lady in the front row and she held her hand up and she said, may I say something? Well, yes, what is that, my dear? And she said, I'm 17 years old, just out of high school, North Hagerstown High School, and I can't wait to get here. And tears formed in her eyes. She said, I live for this class. And I said, why? She said, because I have leukemia, and I don't know how long I have to live. Things like that happened often, and the class was based on the idea that the arts, in all forms, from the simplest to the most complicated, have the capacity to nourish the human spirit. I developed a seat of the pants definition of the arts, which I kind of liked, and it was a working definition. That is, it could be improved and altered with somebody else's uh, input. It goes like this. Everyone sees, but of those who see, some see more deeply. That is to say, they perceive something that they see. And of that group, some of them are talented or gifted, some would even say cursed, to be able to record what they see in order that the rest of us may see. So that George Carlin says, did you ever think about this? And he tells us something, we all laugh. We laugh because we recognize we knew that but didn't know we knew it. You walk past something every day of your life and some art person, somebody making videos, somebody making a movie or telling a joke, they talk about it in a different way. And you see it and you say, I never saw that before, till he or she showed it to me in their art form. And Wordsworth, William Wordsworth, 19th century poet said, I want to present things to people and show it to them as though they're seeing it for the first time and knowing it for what it is. That's what we were trying to do. So I would drag movies in there and talk about the movies. I would drag um, pieces of literature in and uh, poetry and my own stories inter interwoven with those. And it was an exhilarating experience for me and enough people have said to me that they got nourished and that was very gratifying. But I loved doing it. I would, and I got out of control. I'm a very calm person. I don't get too excited about anything, but when I taught that class, I would jump around the room, I would sing, I would dance, I would become something 
better than I was because of the deep feeling of what these art forms have to say to us. Here's one. This, what, listen to this definition. In the fifth chapter, I mean fifth, fifth act of, um, of the Shakespearean play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus says, and as imagination bodies forth the f forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to local habitation um, and gives to local habitation a place and a name, I think it is. Taking abstractions and making them clear for us. That's what the artist does. That's what Rembrandt does in beautiful self-portraits. What Picasso does in Guernica, showing us the, the war, what, what war can do to tear human beings to pieces. Um, so I think these art forms, all of them, song, popular song, oh my. I one time heard, one of the craziest things I heard one time was Joe Cocker singing, You Are So Beautiful To Me. And I thought, he got up into that high range and he couldn't make the note. His voice cracked. Was, Voices then used to crack, but Kenny Rogers' voice cracked, John Denver's voice cracked. And I think, what's this, why don't they take music lessons? But the more I heard Joe Cocker sing, the more I thought, you know, you are so beautiful to me, a statement of what I feel about you, it gets up there to a range where you can't put it into words. It becomes abstraction. Then I realized that the people who speak in tongues, that's where they are. They get up beyond mechanical speech to where the human spirit reaches a divine spirit and it just becomes babble. It becomes something that you can't interpret, but you can feel deeper than anything you've ever felt in your life. So, Joe, go ahead and say it again, because you're right. It's like saying, in effect, I can't find the words to say how much I love you, so I'm just gonna reach up there and, well, this is what I mean. Every, every art form got in there, movies, because I just escaped that pain of my childhood in the movie theater, in the darkness of the theater, and remembered what I saw and what I heard. And I shared them with the folks in the class, and they seemed responsive. I've always thought you either, um, like someone is an alcoholic, for instance, or whatever, addicted to drugs, or whatever, is usually uh, destructive towards themselves because they're not being creative with something. Yes. And that could be creative as a being, uh, creating a family with it, like a mother, or a business or art piece. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I've always said create or destroy is the choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, another odd version, of, uh, a, a sideline to that is, um, you know, when we, we, we were talking about uh, problems that occur in your life, and this problem sometimes will just challenge you or kick you in the ass enough for you to finally make the change you'll finally get to sick and tired of being sick and tired mm -hmm. and uh so you make this change and so it's like you have to destroy yourself mm -hmm. the self that you've been so attached to and comfortable with your misery i'm so i love this miserable life <laughs> i have i'm so, yeah it's my it, this is my my buddy yes. my miserable buddy finally something changes you and destroys that part of you so that the other one can rise from the ashes mm -hmm. so it's sort of so here's that quote every act of destruction is an act of creation mm -hmm. in an odd way <laughs> yes and uh, well two things i remember about that one is some very wise i keep using the word because uh, i love to find wisdom it's hard to find these days there's information more than we need of that but when that gets changed to wisdom i'm not sure but somebody said that everybody who does things differently from the way we do them, let's say neurotic styles, uh, may be unhealthy and bad, but they're helping those people get by. They're doing the best they can until they can find a healthy way to get rid of those dependencies they have to keep themselves going. The other thing I've heard um, about the same thing is that, um, hmm, I've lost it. This happens when you're 71 had two things I wanted to say about that. One is that the 
The neurotic style is people are doing the best they can. They're getting by. If, they, if you made them stop that, they would maybe fall down. But the other side is what? I'm sorry. I've been flowing before. <laughs> now, oh, let it, let, let, now I've crashed. Let it pass by. Okay. So, tell me about uh, joy. What, what, what brings you joy? Oh, my. <clears throat> My father told me before he died that all my life I was, I always paid close attention to things around me. He said, I saw you one time when you were very young, it was a dead rabbit and you knelt down and looked at that rabbit and the look on your face was intense concentration at the hair, at this, at that. And I always asked him interesting questions. He said, I don't remember that. And he tried his best to answer them. And um, I think I'm, in the art form that I do in painting, it's very representational painting. It's not, it's not a current kind of a style. It's, it's maybe old fashioned. But what I try to do is see simple things and portray them as though they have great beauty. And I love simplicity uh, in, in nature and in um, people. I love to ask people questions and hear what they have to say. To me, it's an adventure. I was in Borders the other day spending a gift card. As you can see, I don't need any more. But there was a book on the, on the table that said, listening is a gift. And that stayed in my mind, and I've always believed that, that that's true. People always want to talk about themselves. They always want to tell you, uh, some people tell you that they're tired and they're worn out and they complain and whine and cry and piss and moan. Some people are upbeat, but they sometimes want to lecture. The people I really are gravitating to in my life are people who listen. And I mean listen creatively, not just listen until they get a chance to say their part, but listen. I've tried to do that, and I have to say I've enjoyed it. And... Um, Jesus says in the New Testament somewhere, uh, uh, greater love has no man than he give up his life for his friends. He's probably talking about his own crucifixion. But in everything Jesus says, he's also talking about our behavior. This is what I'm going to do for you. Now, what are you going to do for me? You're going to give up your life for your friends? I thought about that. This is just a couple of years ago after all the seminary and all this reading and studying in the Bible. I thought to myself, now just a minute, when's the last time you saw a human being give up his or her life for somebody else? I don't think I've ever seen it. So if it's not ever done, that's not what he meant. He's not talking about going out and, and taking a bullet or f falling on a hand grenade. What's he talking about? There are enough other passages in the New Testament to indicate to me that what he was talking about was, give up your rights, which is a kind of death. If you have somebody, and I've got some people in my life who talk about themselves without stop, and some people who are angry and complain, and they think they have a right to complain. Well, she did this, or well, like children. Well, he did that. He threw the first sand in the sandbox. He hurt me first. He threw the first stone. Well, I want to say, look, you have a right to complain, I suppose, but could you voluntarily give up that right and not do it? So I've said this on a Sunday morning, and it makes, seems to find, the spark finds some tinder. Give up your right to talk. Be quiet and listen. And here's what happens sometimes. Uh, how did you feel about this, what happened to you last week? Oh, well, it's done now. I said, well, it may be done, but it's something happened to you, and I'd like to know how you feel. Is, are you okay? Do you have time for this? Well, sure. I want to ask, I'm asking you. You say you're fine, but I'm your friend, and I, I love you, and I want to know how you really feel. Well, okay, here's what happened, and here's how I feel, and I listen and shake my head yes, and they keep talking, and I listen, and after all, tears come to their eyes. I've noticed if a friend comes into your home that you haven't seen for 10 years, and you sit down at the kitchen table, after the husbands have gone to bed or the wives or whatever the situation is, and you start talking, and at about 1 o'clock in the morning you get beyond uh, the children and the families and where you go on vacation and 
whether your husband's making a fortune, and then you get down to how are things really going. You get deeper, both of you get deeper. Trust begins to develop over again. You begin to share things you haven't said. You even say the words. I haven't told this to anybody till tonight. I hope you know that. That's okay. And you keep talking, it's three o'clock, it's four o'clock in the morning, you keep talking. Now it's soul to soul, deep to deep. It's that rare sort of experience, doesn't happen every day. And you say, look, we gotta get up at seven o'clock. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna stop right now and put these wine glasses, we'll draw circles around where they are on the table. And we won't move our chairs. We'll get right back here at midnight tomorrow night or tonight and we'll pick up where we left off. Never do it. It seems to me that when I begin to listen to somebody or they begin to listen to me, something almost magic happens. And you can't create it. You can't snap your fingers and call it into being. But once it happens, it's wonderful and nourishing, life-giving, almost miraculous but you can't get it again. It almost has a life of its own. But my point is, it might begin for the human race if we listened with love. I think that's urgently important. And every time I've ever managed to do it, it always seems to bear fruit. Somebody says, I like talking to you. And you say to yourself, why would they say that? Because you listen to them called most conversation dialogues of the deaf that you don't really listen to anybody you just keep battling to talk so there's another aspect listen from your heart is that part yeah of that? Oh, exactly could you could you say that in your own words i would say it this way i would say brian i want to listen to you tonight i, I want you to tell me how you feel and i'm going to listen to what you're saying and I'm going to listen for what you're not saying. I'm going to listen for what, if you had the courage and the trust in me, you would tell me. And that is, I will not judge what you say. I will not um, tell anybody else what you've said. This is between you and me. This is a sacred moment. That old idea, I want to listen for what you're saying, and I'm going to listen for what you can't say, but would love to be able to say. That's certainly from the heart. And I think Jesus, and this is, I'm stepping out of my theology now because I'm thinking of Jesus now not as God-man, but as man. How much of God was there, nobody knows. They think they do, but they don't. I don't know. But I think when he listened to people, he gave everything he had to, their list, to that listening. I think he enveloped them with such a sense of acceptance, love, and non-judgmental stance that they would say anything. I think they were not only crying, every cell in their body was being touched by wholeness that they didn't themselves have. And after this happened, and he would, he would not look anywhere else, he would not think of anything else, you are the most important thing on the face of the earth right now. In the next 10 or 15 minutes, I will do nothing. I will not look away from you, I will not glance at my watch. I want to hear everything you have to say. I almost think, Brian, that if we could do that the way he did it, I don't know how you do it. Maybe Chopra knows. I don't know. I think he might. If you do that, isn't it conceivable that you're not just making people feel good emotionally? You might make their body feel good. There might be healing in that. I'm out on a limb saying all that. There is healing in that. That's the genuine. That's the biggest. That's the biggest compliment you can give someone. That. The person's genuine. Yes. They, they listen. They patiently listen for the answer. Yes. They have that, and it's it is love. It's unconditional love. I think it's it's maybe the best expression of love. I mean, what is better than what's more important than that? I mean, they're husbands and wives and best friends who don't do that enough of the time. The question you asked is about joy, and when I see people. Here we go again. My grandmother was out hanging clothes on the line, and I was a little five or six-year-old. And the next-door neighbor came over, a neighbor lady, and they started talking, and they were laughing. And as they were laughing, I felt so good inside that they were having a good time. It was so positive, and I thought, oh, this is wonderful. I guess the old phrase she herself used was tickled pink. 
I, I felt that. I felt that deeply. And I always believed as a child, very naively and idealistically, that if we could feel that with people, neighbors and somebody, anybody else, the world would lose a lot of its problems. If you think about it, listening is what's keeping wars going. Not listening, I mean. Uh, the government, our government's broken to pieces by people who don't pay attention to anybody else. They won't listen to anybody. Um, we don't talk to countries we don't like. We should be talking to everybody, listening to everybody, but it isn't happening. And it, it's not necessarily, could you, could you explain how it's not necessarily listening from the ears or from the brain, but from the heart? Yes, well, I think it's, um, when I read something, I brought, the only thing I brought in prepared to share was, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard so many preachers in churches uh, I'm sorry, this is a terrible judgment I shouldn't make. Maybe I'm not allowed to make it. But um, there's too much, there's too much uh, didactic, too much teaching. And uh, there's a, a writer, the only person I ever wrote to, the only writer I ever wrote a letter to. His name is Frederick Beekner, lives in Vermont, Presbyterian minister, novelist. Everybody in the church that I respect, respect him and listen to what he has to say. And here's what he says about preaching. I want you to hear these verbs. The preacher is up front. Out of the silence, let the only real news come, which is sad news before it is glad news, and this fairy tale, the last of all. The preacher is not brave enough to be literally silent for long, and since it's his calling to speak the truth with love, even if he were brave enough, he would not be silent for long because we are none of us very good at silence. It says too much. So let him use words. But in addition to using them to explain, expound, exhort, let him use them to evoke, to set us dreaming as well as thinking, to use words as at their most prophetic and truthful, the prophets use them to stir in us memories and longings and intuitions that we starve for without knowing that we starve. Let him use words which do not only try to give answers to the questions that we ask or ought to ask, but which help us to hear the questions that we do not have words for asking and to hear the silence that those questions rise out of and the silence that is the answer to those questions. Now listen to this. This makes me feel tingly. Drawing on nothing fancier than the poetry of his own life. Let him use words and images that help make the surface of our lives transparent to the truth that lies deep within them, which is the wordless truth of who we are and who God is and the gospel of our meeting. You could take a seminary class in preaching and say, just read that every day for 16 weeks and I'll give you an A. That's from the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Guy's terrific, by the way. I just happened to be sharing that with somebody yesterday and I thought, I don't know where that'll fit in, but I'll have it at hand. Is he a friend of yours now? Not a friend, no. He, uh, I wrote to him and I said, don't write back. I don't want you to have to do that. But he did write a two-page letter. And he is, um, as I said, any clergyman that I know today that is worth his or her salt knows this man and quotes him all the time. He's just very good. So when my writing was out of appreciation, I used one of his books in my class at the college. Excellent book. The passages just knock you out. They're so good. Have you written any books? No, I don't think I can write very well. I would be, um, but I have done these tapes, and bef well, I'll but tell see, you this. See, these tapes might work this way, too. Even better. You think so? Yeah, because imagine taking these stories that you're telling to the camera. Yes. And having just a few seconds of you sitting there, just so you put a face to the voice. Yes. And then having the images, some images come up. Hmm. You know, that are part of the story. And maybe even some words. Come up. In 1979, I left the church that you and your family were a part of. I had gone there in 1966, so for 13 years, I did the best I could. And sometime it was good, and I've shared some of that with you. I grew up while I was there. I, uh, but I thought that since those people were so affirming of me, I mean, the Hardens and the rest of the people there, the Galbraiths and the Dwight Scotts and the whole crowd, people I admired immensely, they were looking up to me, looking for food. They thought I had a 
basket full of bread to throw at him. I threw it the best I could. But um, when it came time to leave, and I wasn't retiring or going to another church, I was quitting. I was skulking off to San Clemente like Richard Nixon because I'd made some mistakes. So when I left there, I had to get some help to leave. It was so hard to stop. The reason being, I thought that having grown up from age 30 to age 43, that this congregation gave me my identity. We like what you're saying. You are helping us. Ooh, I'm helping you? Oh, good. That's all I ever want to do is help somebody. If I quit, I'd be in trouble. I had a nightmare. It happened three times, as these kind often do. I'm walking down a street on Washington Street where there used to be some department stores, and it's back in that day, apparently. I'm walking along, minding my own business, and an old lady is walking. An old lady. Looks like that old lady in blazing saddles that, that <laughs> talked to the black sheriff. She's bending over with, a, with an umbrella and a shopping bag, and she walks down, and she looks up at me as we pass each other. I'm going east, she's going west. She takes her umbrella off her arm and hits me with it. Not to hurt me, but to get my attention. Bang, bang, bang. Young man, aren't you Ben Jones? And I looked at her and stuttered these words. I, I used to be, but I resigned. My whole identity was wrapped up with that church. I thought, if I leave there, I'll, re I'll revert to being 13 or 14 again. Well, I didn't. And anybody else would know that I wouldn't have. I didn't. Um, that's the kind of thing that I was growing out of. But I went then, before I left the church, I went to St. James School. I'd been giving chapel talks there every year since I was in town. And the headmaster liked what I had to say and the way I said it. So I said, Jack, can I get a job here teaching part-time? He said, absolutely. I started teaching sacred studies and again began doing chapel talks, assisting in chapel. And um, I told my stories. And sometimes the stories I told found their way into classes, English classes, and sometimes the faculty had discussions around the next day's breakfast about the stories. It was very flattering, but I was just doing what I could do. I couldn't do any more than this, or maybe even less than this. So I told all my stories, and then after a while I left, because the art career and taking over. Last year, two years ago, um, St. James asked, asked if I'd come down and give a talk on the arts at Alumni Weekend. And I got all my stuff together and gave my talk. After I did the talk, there was a social following and uh, some food and drink, and a woman came up to me and she said, listen, um, I graduated here just a couple of years ago, so I don't know you, but that lady over there was here when you were here, and she's a lawyer in Alexandria, Virginia, and she told me a story that you told. And I said, what story was that? And she told me the story. It was verbatim what I had said in the chapel. And so I had to find this young lady. So I went over to see her, and I didn't remember her name. She told me, oh, yes. She said, I'll never forget that story. That has touched my life very deeply. Here's the story. On a cold January day with blowing snow and hard rocky ground, I, sitting inside my house, another house before this, I was at that time part-time pastor of the Emmitsburg Presbyterian Church. And a guy called from a Thurmont funeral home and said, Pastor, I have a person who's died, and would you come to a funeral uh, tomorrow? And I said, well, why? Is it somebody from my parish? No, no, it's not. I said, well, then why, why do you want me to do this? He said, can I tell you the story? Okay. He said, this young couple in Thurmont had twin boys last week. And uh, shortly after the birth, one died, lived a day or two and died. The second has survived. And they came to me to do the funeral. And their pastor at their church went to see them, as pastors do, went to their, their house and said this to them. Do you think... If you'd have been more active in the church, this wouldn't have happened to your child. And I said, what time is the funeral? I said to him, I will run to Thurmont in bare feet to do the service. 
to get some of the bullshit out of that. I mean, oh, I, I couldn't, I was speechless. I mean, grace and grace and gratitude are the two poles of my preaching, grace and gratitude. And um, gratitude is the biggest thing of all. And right behind that, snuggled up right against it is the idea of grace, that much of life is given to us. And the love of God is given to us. I can't always understand it, but I can experience it. This is the story the girl heard. And she said, I've never forgot it. I can almost see those people in, my, in, the, in the story you told. And the thing is, it was 20 years ago. And she said, will you ever write these down, the stories you told? And I said, oh, I don't know. Somebody else asked me that. Somebody else asked me that. Somebody else asked me that. And I said, well, I don't know what to say. Um, I'm too lazy to write. I think that's the answer. It's not a lack of talent. It's, not, it's being lazy. So I just had this project that's six months old. I'm taking that old tape recorder over there, and I'm not preparing, I'm not writing scripts, I'm just telling stories, and I'm up to 100 stories. I have two full, um, what, how much is it? Two full one and a half hour tapes now, so that's three hours of listening so far. And I've given them to a couple of people whose opinion I trust to see if it's worth going on. Something you don't know is, um, I've always been a fan of yours. And so when I found out you were gonna teach in college, it was like, that's why I'm at this college. Really? For that summer, yeah, so that's why. It's like it drove me in. So I immediately, as soon as I found out you were teaching, I called up Derek Herps and said, Derek, Ben Jones is teaching. Where? At the local college. Take the class with me. He was like, okay. So he showed up with me. Mm -hmm. And because we missed your stories. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, a huge part of my growth in my life has been because hearing the simple stories. I hate the Bible. The thy know thou. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 I, yeah. can't, I can't understand it. That was, that was not adult language. That was... Yes. That, that's archaic. It is. Stilted archaic. And yes. it's, it doesn't communicate. There's no heart behind it. And mm -hmm. it, it was not written by Jesus. It was written mm -hmm. by, and sure. then interpreted, and then interpreted again, and yes. then it's turned into this mess, and then there's thousands of other people that have, have interpreted it. And there's, there, where's the truth? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, if Jesus were, were here today, his message would be simple. Mm-hmm. And he speaks through us with the simplicity. Mm -hmm. he, I, I don't think I don't think Jesus ever stood up and tried to teach to the masses in the way that most ministers do. No, he he was more of mm -hmm. come down to the level. And I I've always felt when I listen to most ministers, it's like come up to my level and try to understand this crap. Yeah, and I I can't. I don't want to. Right. I want You're to right. go. I, I want. I want it to be the golden rule. Mm -hmm. And then give me three little stories. That's what. Sure. I, that's how I grew up. Is you telling me mm -hmm. three little stories and me sitting on the edge of the seat, <laughs> hearing about you playing with your marbles and your <laughs> you neighbor remember. and your neighbor stole your marbles yeah. and then some football, some Sunday mm -hmm. Super Bowl yeah. football game sure. and the tax man. And then yeah. somehow take those three stories and jam them together, yeah, and right. that's in relation to the burning bush. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you do that? Yeah. And that was that was your gift is is keeping the audience always understanding the simple message because mm -hmm. none of this spirituality is difficult. No. And I don't know why we make it so difficult. We do. All that. these books say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And, 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 and it, it, it com comes down to, like, I think, you know, do unto others is, is the golden rule. But, like, mm -hmm. if you hate yourself, mm -hmm. you hate everybody. That's right. You have the capacity to love anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to do unto you before you do unto me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And, and so, yeah. and, uh, so I, I, well, I, I guess it's like, uh, you know, it's, 
God is within us, mm -hmm. and we are all capable of being like Christ, mm -hmm. Christ-like. That's right. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes, exactly. So, and, you know, what would Jesus do is part of the whole mm -hmm. thing. And every once in a while you get it right. It's possible, and I'm just saying that I've been trying so, I grew up in a fundamentalist Presbyterian church. Not rigid, brittle fundamentalism, but enough of it. And the deal in evangelical Christianity, that's the big word you hear today about the political people, who's an evangelical Christian, who's born again. What's interesting is that kind of talk is not very old. We get the impression from the great evangelical preachers that that's the way it's been since uh, 30 AD, that people had to make a decision for Christ, accept Christ as your savior. You'll be born again, you'll go to heaven when you die. That structure, that construct, is relatively recent in the history of the church. And it came about as a result of the 19th century attack of rationalism on the church. And we had to have some way, we felt, to, to get control again of people. And the way to do it was that there had to be some clear, rational, decision-making process that could be spelled out. You know, business likes to do that. Um, people who do, um, what do they call them, events where they teach you how to do this or that. I'm going to give you four steps. Here they are. Bang, bang, bang. Bang. Um, I think that is simplistic. And I don't think it's the New Testament. I don't see it anywhere in the New Testament. I think it's a construction made by people who, who want to have everybody do the same thing. If I was all at once struck in, in the heart by the truth, the conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I fell down on my knees and I wept about that, and I got up from my knees a better man. I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. That's also something that's not at all old. That's very, very new, that word personal. Um, that's to keep people from saying he's really the Savior of all the people and all that. It's got to be just you. It's a transaction you're making. Um, and therefore now I will try not to sin. I'll read my Bible. I'll pray and I'll go to heaven when I die. And the main thing I have to do right now, and I, this is the way it comes out, I'm sorry to say, the main thing I have to do now as a result of these transactions and these feelings and these ideas and these decisions is go tell other people about my faith and convert them. Now, what I'm saying is where is the moral and ethical result of experiencing the love of God? People who really have had a genuine experience will have something of the love of God and the grace of things in, their, in themselves, and they won't be going out trying to buttonhole and get people to make these decisions they're talking about. So I think that thing is very much misguided. I never thought I'd say that, but I'm saying it. And here's the thing I believe, and I, I believe it with all my heart and soul, and it grows out of everything you've heard tonight. <clears throat> Where am I in the church today? You say golden rule. I'm not going to take exception to that, but I'm going to add to it. One of the saints of the church said something that if I had anything to do with it, I would have on the front of every church building, inside where people could see it. You know, there's something up there that says, come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden, I'll give you rest, Jesus comment. Others say other things on the communion table, behind some pulpits that only the preacher can see it says sir we would see Jesus that's instructions to you as you get up to speak um, the saint said these words this has become central in my faith both my own practice of the Christian faith and the teaching of it and here it is the glory of God is and I always like the pause there for, before the predicate comes up because there are lots of answers people would give. What is the glory of God? Saving somebody's soul. What's the glory of God? Going to heaven when I die. This saint said, the glory of God is a fully realized human being. I think that is not only profound, it is almost um, sublime. Jesus, in relating to everybody ever related to, was bringing them to fullness. And the people I respect in the, in the religion business today all say something like this. And it's so life-giving. I mean, think about that. The glory of God 
is a fully realized human being. Shedding all the limitations that keep us back, knowing perspective, knowing who you are, and therefore being able to relate to other people in a genuinely mutual give and take kind of fashion. What is better than that? The people that have these great big salvation factories, the great big buildings with 10,000 people, are they changing the world out there? I mean, they may be having a good time. What's somebody call them? The slappy happy churches? Clappy happy churches. I am sound like I'm being critical, but I don't see much coming out of those places that changes the neighborhoods and changes the country. Um, the mainline churches, Presbyterian church, is going down the drain. I mean, it's losing people all the time. And I've seen it time and time again. And the big, big places, there are some people in those that are doing a good job, I think. And I think they are starting to emphasize this concept. And where that's happening, I think it's wonderful. Where it's not, it's a tragedy. I've always understood holy to be spelled with a W in front of it. Yes. Whole. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that's mind, body, spirit. Yes. And that is that relates to me. I've always understood that as <clears throat> Father. Yeah. The Spirit. Mm -hmm. Son is 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 is, uh, is mind. The Father's mind. Spirit's. Yes. Uh, uh, Jesus is is the body. Yes. And then the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mind, body, spirit. Yes. And the trick, the real trick in our living is to get this thing, our head, out mm -hmm. of the way. Mm -hmm. Turn our head off. Yeah. Turn that, we're addicted to, to thought and chatter. That's what this and, guy was saying. Yeah, and exactly. And so we, we, if we can turn that brain off and go into meditation mode or yes. prayer, yes. Or, and the prayer shouldn't be, God, bring me the Porsche I need. Mm -hmm. It's... It's more like bring me the experience I need mm -hmm. so I can grow. Yes. And that experience might be to have my leg cut off mm -hmm. by the train. Mm -hmm. So like, so that then I'll have an experience that will help me grow. Mm -hmm. I mean, and give thanks for losing my leg. <laughs> and, people, and people talk like that all yeah. the time. Yeah. They tell stories like that. You just told it a while ago. Yeah. You lost your money. The best thing that ever happened to you. It was. And, you know, Uncle Lynn. Mm -hmm. My Uncle Lynn with the tracheotomy yes, and the ventilator yes. and the whole uh -huh. bit. He said he wasn't whole until he lost his life and we had a tracheotomy and a ventilator and he couldn't talk for six months. What happened to him? Oh, he had polio all his life. Oh, is that and what he ended was? up down in Atlanta. Um, and his, you know, polio de degenerates your muscles. Eventually mm -hmm. his lungs uh, were starting to not work so he yeah. started on pure oxygen um he was sleeping in the basement uh and it was hard for him to his shoulders were giving out his muscles and his shoulders were giving out so it's hard for him to get up in bed and crawl mm -hmm. around and so on so he uh started sleeping on the ground and it was moldy you know uh, you know mm -hmm. damp it was damp mm -hmm. and that got into his lungs and created pneumonia no one knew it he didn't even know it so he had pneumonia and no muscles in his lungs left, and he's on pure oxygen. And he ended up 911 at the hospital, and they had to put a tracheotomy in. Mm. And they said, you've got horrible pneumonia. So they put him in the greatest place in the world, supposedly. The greatest hospital in all the world to get rid of this pneumonia and to save his life. Well, he stayed in there for six months. And they what were, hospital? They, uh, it's in Atlanta. What was it called? I, I forget. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something real big important hospital mm -hmm. and he could they wouldn't put air in the cuff so he couldn't talk mm. so for six months this intelligent man who knows how to run every electronic device can't even talk hmm. can't pre can't talk to understand or no one's ever taught him how to press the buttons on this machine that's beeping all the time mm -hmm. that's that's whether or not he's how how do you run this thing mm -hmm. no one ever taught him that so he's got a huge anxiety he can't talk, can't communicate, he's frustrated out of his mind. So he's basically just said, I give up. Send me to Hagerstown to that crappy little hospital over by North High, mm -hmm. and I'll just die there, is what he thought. <laughs> For real. Mm -hmm. And you know, my mom, and she's not going to give up on him. Mm -hmm. I'm not either. So I go down and grab all his computers in Atlanta, bring them up, set them all up here for him. 
in this goofy little room and gave him something to do, he finally can go out and get his email. As soon as he got here at this crappy little hospital that doesn't have any of those fancy machines or any of the big fancy doctors with all mm -hmm. the little things on the wall, we've got some old doctor that uses a stethoscope, puts it up to his chest, and he hears, you've got pneumonia right up in here. They said they cleared it up, and it's still up here. I can hear it right here. Mm. Tap, tap, tap. And uh, we're going to put air in their cuff so you can talk. Within three days, he could talk. Mm. Suddenly, he's going, how do you run this machine? And the doctor's like, oh, it's simple. You just press these buttons, and when it's beeping, you press here and check this. And Lynn's like, thank what you. What year was that? Oh, it was, uh, I don't know, 97 or something. Mm -hmm. 98, I don't know. I don't know, it's, it's been a while. So anyway, here it is 10 years later, and Lynn's still alive. Mm -hmm. Not only still alive, he ran, <laughs> He was a city councilman mm -hmm. for several years. He, he still runs his own business, My High, many individuals helping individuals. Yes. And he and I went shopping for about 15 people where he gave to charity. Mm -hmm. Now, he's the most disabled person I've ever met. Yes, he really is. Yet he still every day is up doing stuff. He mm -hmm. wakes up early, goes and runs and does stuff, and, and comes home late. And he's mm -hmm. always doing, because he, he knows he could die any minute. One of his funny stories is, I don't buy green bananas. <laughs> so he cha he changed the city government in many ways by d by doing that. He got in there and you know they take you know forever. Mm -hmm. they, they make a meeting to have a meeting to m make schedule for a meeting to eventually talk about this thing that they're going to eventually maybe fix. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Lynn on the first meeting's like, I don't buy green bananas. Everybody knows we need that bridge over there. I I want to, I want to put a, 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 a call out to every construction person in this county. I want to keep the jobs in this county. I want every construction person in this county to give me a bid by next Thursday. And uh, we have the money sitting over there. So uh, by next Thursday, we're going to have the bids on the table. By, next, by the Monday following, we'll start the contract. And it uh, will only take bids from those people who can start work Monday after. Mm. And I want that bridge built in two months. And they do it. And it changed the whole mm -hmm. way of doing business. And he, the one thing he learned years ago was the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm -hmm. So he squeaks more than anybody. But yes. Man, he said his life changed radically once he became uh, near death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once, like, in, you know, he could die tonight. I mean, he's, he's always in that, like 10 days ago, he was in horrible shape. He was in the hospital, you know, over mm -hmm. the past couple of months. And many yes, times. I've heard that. Nine one one stuff, but yet he's still shopping with me. We're out mm -hmm. doing. He's he's rocking. Yes. He's enjoy living life in the moment. Mm -hmm. Going to do what he can to. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he outlived his father. Really. He never had polio. <laughs> Gee. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So judgment. How do, how do we get rid of judgment? Um. We have to realize that we're in no position to judge. I mean, Jesus says this in the New Testament, and others have said it outside of religion. In order to make a judgment of somebody else's behavior, I have to be perfect, it seems to me. Everybody's in the same boat. And uh, I've often, you just you uh, alluded to this earlier, that there's some preachers that think they're, um, they give the sense at least, and I hear them on the radio sometimes, that they've achieved something and now, you have to figure out what it is you can do the way I do it, or something of that nature. That's maybe being unfair, but I've always felt that we're first, that we're all in the same boat. That um, we, I get up on a Sunday morning, not anymore, but I used to get up on a Sunday morning and share thoughts and ideas about our growth and development and the faith and in our humanity. But if somebody else got up and talked, I would pay exactly the same attention to them they paid to me. As a result of that, I always had lay people fail on Sundays because they were part of our family. You know, some preacher from Altoona, Pennsylvania doesn't know us, but your father knows us. So it's people like that that I would say, I want you to do this talk on Sunday morning. And I sort of more or less trained them as to what they could do, how they could do it, but it had to be their own stuff. And we had powerful occasions when lay people, one of them was a man named Bob Lico, one of them more integrity than most people have ever known. He was in the military and he was a West Point graduate. Um, 
he was a, I don't know what they call artillery, no, he was a tank commander. And he was in one of the wars and he became the um, military adjunct or whatever, not adjunct, adjutant, oh, I can't think of the word, to the embassy in the Soviet Union, our embassy in the Soviet Union, military attache. And um, while he was there, he and all of his colleagues got microwaved and they all came out with illnesses of a blood disorder sort. And he got aplastic anemia, was sent to Fort Hood, Texas, and told him they told him he would die. But somebody got the idea of shipping him to Walter Reed, and then somebody else said, no, make it um, uh, National Institutes of Health. What's that? NIH in Bethesda. He went there, and they cured it. And I said to him, um, Bob, I'm going to be away next uh, month because you, you think you would like to give a talk. And the title of his uh, homily was, Why Me? Not why did I become ill, but why did I live? I have friends that didn't live. Why, why me? Why am I alive today? And how do I look at my life now that I almost died but didn't? Same thing. And I have to say, that sermon of his was more powerful than any one that I did. And this is not false humility, it's true. I can't say what he said. I can't even tell his story for him. He's got to tell his story. The Sunday he told that story, people had a powerful experience. Now the trick is, can he do it 51 more Sundays? <laughs> He's got one story, essentially. That's why his one story is better than any one of mine, but I can go on 51 more weeks and do something passable anyway. So. You juggle though, right? Oh, you do, sure. <laughs> yeah, more, well, <laughs> metaphorically. <laughs> um, yeah, anybody that's had that experience knows that life is a precious gift. It really is. Life is a gift. I mean, we are, you and I are sitting here right now, have no notion of what combination of things in our bodies is attacking us and what might happen next week. And knowing that, I mean, just all these people that say, if you don't come to terms with the fact that someday you're going to die, you're not going to live well. You've got to know that's a reality. And some people don't want to hear that, but the best people we know say it. Well, I had that near-death experience, so yes. I have no fear of death. Yeah. None. Right. Well, it changed your life. Yeah, it, it made me embrace life in a different way. Yes. Yeah. Maybe that's why you can be with Lynn and be helpful to him. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah, like he, yeah, he, he's got a, yeah, he's got, yeah, he's pretty bulletproof. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He will go down one day, and you know, mm -hmm. he, he has no regrets, like no, absolutely, mm -hmm. and I don't think he has any fear of it, you know. And mm -hmm. I had my my aunt, uh, aunt, uh, aunt Ferry. Uh, they told her she was going to die, and I can't die. I've got things to do. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. As long as sure. you're busy, I think it's fine. Yeah. And see, Lynn's always busy. Mm -hmm. So he's not even going to think about his problems. He's staying on. Yeah. He's got things to. He's got a world to change here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know where you want to go next, unless you we've had. Well, the acceptance. We, basically, joy. Uh, we handled a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, judgment, a little bit. Acceptance is is pretty much just loving yourself you know and like you know you know I, I guess every every mistake that we do or problem things that happen to us that we have to also forgive ourselves mm -hmm. and we also have to accept the the problem also is is uh you know they say in, in uh, uh chinese uh the the letters that they, they do those beautiful letters that the the word they have for crisis is the same word for opportunity so at some point you have to look at that crisis and give thanks and accept mm -hmm. it as the way it is and yes. accept mm -hmm. and, and accept within everybody whatever their thing is do you, do you have anything along the lines of any of that well it's just one thing at least and that is um there's an old it's almost become a cliche but i have a good friend an academic man who says if things weren't true, they wouldn't become cliches. So they are true, and therefore we say them often, maybe too often. 
But the old cliche is you can't love anybody else until you, till you've learned to love yourself. That's one that comes to mind. And um, along with that, I've often said that if you are preoccupied with your problems, then you can't be available to other people. You're going to moan and complain to them. So you have to get yourself off your hands. That's one of the phrases I would use, one of the statements. And by getting myself off my hands, I'm free. I have no need to lecture you, no need to tell you how terrible I feel, but rather I'm very interested in hearing who you are, where you've been, how you got to where you are, and all that. Now tonight, you're wanting me to talk, so I'm doing a very uh, uncharacteristic thing by just going on and on in answer to your questions. But getting myself off my hands, and I had that happen to me in my 40s, where I didn't have any need. I'll tell you, this is how bad I was. This is, this is humiliating. Somebody in this town elected me to the um, Washington County Board of Education um, Community, Action, Community Advisory Council. It meant that certain people in the community, there was a judge, there was a lawyer, there was a doctor, there was an Indian chief, there was a this, that, and the other thing, professional people. I was the minister. And I'm on this thing, and our job was to field problems and questions in the community. And every school in the, in the county had a, uh, a, a citizens advisory committee. We were the council overseeing the entire county. The chairman of the advisory council was Ken Mackley, uh, a very outspoken lawyer in town. And uh, Ken Mackley was the strong, powerful presence. I went in there early in my time in Hagerstown and I was afraid of being there, these powerful people. And I would sit there, I wouldn't say much, I would shake my head. I, always on the outside I looked fine. Inside I, hmm, what am I doing here? I feel like I'm 16 years old. So I got a three-piece suit, wore that, and got a gold chain, had no significant pin to hang on it, but I wanted to look a little more important. And this is what I did, and I hate to tell you this. I would listen to what the subject was, and I would make up very fine, polished paragraphs of something to say. And I would work on the paragraph in my mind to respond to something. By the time I got the paragraph set so that it was terrific English and very impressive, they were on another subject. Too late to speak. I was afraid just to talk. I had to prepare prepare my face, put my mask on, impress, so they would know that I was somebody important and not just a jerky little 16-year-old kid in a three-piece suit. So I did this for over a year. And the second year of my time on the thing, I made it a, I got nervous. I'd come home scared and I was, I was tired of pretending. I said, okay, I'm gonna just speak. I'm not totally stupid, I'm not brilliant, but I'm not stupid. I'm going to take a risk and just say what's on my mind without preparing anything. So one night, with great difficulty, I said, uh, it uh, um, seems to me that with regard to this issue before us now, it's possible there are only two alternatives. And I would like to say that of the two alternatives, and here they are, bang, bang, I prefer B for the following reasons. That's what I have to say. And they all looked at me. and There was a silence. And the chairman said, can you say a little more about uh, this for us? And I said, well, further than that, I can't go right now, but I can tell you directions we might take for this thing. Oh, well, thank you. I never said anything like this before. So I thought, well, it worked. So I kept it up. They elected me chairman for the second two years I was on the council. It was such a relief not to have to pretend anymore. I mean, I wasn't profound. There were people there that could run circles around me, but at least I wasn't a phony anymore. But I was a phony before that. When I was in seminary, Brian, you won't believe this. I have three children. I'm married with three children. I'm 26 years old. You know, think of where you were when you were 26 and listen to what I'm going to say now. This is even more embarrassing than the three-piece suit. I was, I was in seminary and I had no income at all, three children. And they said you could get a church where you could be a student pastor. They wouldn't give me one. They said, you don't have enough experience. I said, but I don't have any money. Well, find a job. 
So I went for another couple of months, and I said, I can't do this anymore. I got to quit school. And they go, well, we'll get you a church. But I came, well, okay, we didn't understand then. Blah, blah, blah. So I got this little church, Morningside Presbyterian Church, and I was going over for the first meeting of this, with the session, and they were going to see if they wanted to have me. And I couldn't be a moderator. It had to be some other minister ordained. So they got this guy from down the street. His name was John Earl Myers. Myers came in, and uh, I was at the meeting, and John Earl Myers walked up to me with a great big smile on his face and grabbed my hand and said, Ben, how are you? Good to meet you. And I said, I'm fine, uh, Reverend Myers. Oh, call me John. Oh, yes, well, John, I'm fine. And he said, what family do you have? Let's see, my father is drunk most of the time. My mother has died, and I've got a sloppy, stupid stepmother. I have, my father's not the mayor of the town. He didn't teach school. He wasn't, uh, I thought, well, yeah, what am I going to tell this man about what family I've got? And I went back into my mind. I saw myself running down aisles with computer uh, information. And I knew it. So my father said something about on the Eastern Shore, somewhere in Trap, Maryland, there was some cousin of his or a second cousin who was on the board of a bank. And I said, that's it. Stuck it in my head and out of my mouth came the words, I have an uncle that owns a bank on the Eastern Shore. 26 years old. He looked at me as if to say, what the hell are you talking about? And I knew within 20 seconds that he was asking about, do you have a wife? Do you have any children? But I was so set up to be judged and criticized because of being a nobody that I had to lie about being somebody, and I said that absurd thing. Happily, uh, John Earl Myers did not think I was an idiot, and we began being friends, played tennis together, and had a good life. But I'll never forget that. And it's the kind of humiliation you say, oh God, don't ever let me do that again. <laughs> and don't ever let me sit in a room for a year and a half pretending as though I'm important when I think I'm nobody. That's what I call getting yourself off your hands. I had so much crappy luggage to carry around that I couldn't be honest. But and you made it through it. You learned from those challenges. I did. I, did. I didn't forget them. And I always felt like I... I I wanted to do the right thing, and I wanted to activate some kind of attention for other people. I knew that. But the, back in the beginning, it was to get them to like me. That's how deep the need was. But when I got myself off my hands, to use my statement, I didn't do it because I needed anything. I did it because I loved doing it. It's been a wonderful experience. Changed my life entirely. I didn't nearly die the way you did, the way that Lynn did or Bob Lico did, I didn't ever have that. <clears throat> so mine took a longer time. It wasn't some sudden burst over top of my head one night in the hospital. For me, it was a gradual, agonizingly long process till I was probably 45 before I was suitable to be a human being. Whole. Whole. And by the way, to coincide with what you said, you know the word salvation, which is bandied about all the time, Salvation comes from a root in Latin, salus, which means hygiene or health. And that falls into the saint saying, the glory of God is a fully realized human being. Mm. So salvation at its very heart means wholeness. You've said it before. And by the way, not only that, but the word... Um, um, what's the word, shalom, that the Jewish people use all the time? At the heart of shalom is peace. But the peace is not just the end of warfare. All the weapons have been dropped. The smoke is cleared and we have bodies to pick up. But the war's over. No, not that. Peace is things the way they were intended to be. In the creation stories of the Old Testament, God saw what he had made and said it is good. That's what we were designed to be, good, and we fell away. Now, to get that peace, irene is the New Testament word, based on shalom, the Old Testament word, the Hebrew root. So shalom, which is a greeting, is, and I have a friend in town, I don't see him, but once every 10 years maybe, he's a dentist, a children's dentist, and I'm down in these Jewish, his wife's family was in the Holocaust, 
I was in a Lowe's to get something and from way far away, here he comes across the store and he sees me from maybe 40 feet away and he calls out to me. He looks like Pancho Villa, he has a big black mustache and black hair. He said, Ben, are you well? Not how are you or how's tricks, but are you well? Do you have any shalom in your body, heart, mind, and soul? And I said, oh, Jeff, so good to see you. How refreshing. First time I ever met him, I was in the art room, and I was superintending the pottery the building. It was adjacent to us, because I could get a couple extra bucks doing that. And I would go in there every night to see that the lights were out and the kilns were shut off. And I would go, and here's this guy sitting there making pots, and he looks like Viva Zapata with this dark complexion and dark eyebrows and big, droopy mustache. And finally, I said, I always said, good night. Are you going to be out soon? He said, yeah, I'll be leaving. And so one night I said, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> Not confrontive, but curious. He told me his name and that he was a dentist. And I said, I've heard of you, but I've never seen you. Well, now we've gotten together. And I said, why do you do this? He said, you used the word earlier tonight. He said, this is the thing in my life that causes me to center my being. If I don't put this clay on this spinning wheel on just the center and shape, it'll fly apart. And if I don't center myself, I'll fly apart. This gives me a great sense of calm and a great sense of peace, making pots. That's where those stories come from. It's stuff I've really seen. Every once in a while in these tapes I'm going to give you, there are times when I have read something that I want to read, but not much. I want them to be, as this man says, poetry no fancier than his own life. It's not that, obviously, my life is not very special, but it, things happen and I see them. Everybody has these things happen, but they don't see them. And if they see them, they don't know how to tell them. That's all I can say about it. And the words just come. I don't have to figure them out. They just, I just, what it is, I see it in my mind and just describe it. If that's a gift, then so be it. I, don't, I didn't do anything to get it. I never did a thing. It just naturally developed. And here you are saying it was a good thing, and here's somebody else telling me that, and Jack Schaefer was the uh, president of the hospital, or the guy that ran the hospital, and he, when I left Covenant Church, he and two other people got together and said, we don't feel like we're getting fed. Could we have a meeting in our homes every Thursday night? Would you like to lead that for us? And I said, well, I wouldn't mind doing that. We had lunch at the Sheraton to talk about it, and Jack, who was a very enthusiastic man, he died of a terrible heart problem, but and Jack said to me, almost with a childish, childlike delight, he said, and will you tell some of those stories? And he was all enthused. And I said, well, yeah, sure. I would feel that's what you like, I would. He said, oh, I like that. So there's been a real um, enthusiasm for that in the classroom and in church. But I got to be honest that every time I come home here, I keep thinking I'm going to call you. Oh, wish you had. <laughs>